Uh, today's presentation is going to be with uh, Professor Robert Kelly. He is a distinguished, oops, sorry, my slides are moving faster than I am today. Great. He's a distinguished professor of management at the Tepper School. He has begun doing his, uh, his career at Drake University, went on to uh, continue his studies at the University of Texas at Austin, and then his PhD from Colorado State University and his postdoctor work at the Harvard School. And he's joined the Tepper faculty in 1985. He's an award-winning teacher with innovative courses and uh, developing star performers, followership, leadership, managing intellectual capital and designing customer-driven strategies and services. He's the author of six books, uh, which uh, you'll see one of them here highlighted, uh, How to Be a Star at Work. Many of you have had his classes in the past, would have participated and, and uh, read that book, uh, but he's a great author. And his book was considered one of the 100 best business books of all time. He's also an international speaker as a, and consultant, has worked with many organizations, some of the leading ones here. And you can learn more about Professor Kelly's uh, amazing ideas and his impactful strategies uh, by going to kellyideas.com. So I'm very happy to introduce him today. He's one of our most beloved professors at the Tepper School, and I know he enjoys the opportunity to speak with our, his students and with alumni. So join me in welcoming Professor Robert Kelly. And let me give my own uh, hearty welcome to uh, all of our Tepper alums out there. I wish I could see you in person and we could uh, uh, catch up with each other, but also a hearty welcome to all our uh, CMU uh, alums who have joined and the families and friends that have joined. And today I wanna share with you uh, uh, my latest book, which is gonna be coming out soon on uh, the topic is the critical path. But before I do that, what I need to do is um, uh, go back and give you just a, a brief 30, uh, 30 second or maybe three minute history of how this book came about. And the way it started was uh, with a, um, uh, my work on how to be a star at work and where we were asked the question by a number of companies, started with AT&T, but it went to uh, 3M and Hewlett Packard and Shell Oil and a number of companies. And they all had the same issue. And that issue was they hire what they think are the best and the brightest. Uh, but uh, after a few years, some people rise to the top. Most people end up in the middle and some they wish they'd never hired. And they were curious, why does that happen? And so, uh, so what I'd like you to just spend a minute thinking about is uh, think of a star performer, think of an average performer and what's the difference? And why is one a star and the other average? And why are there some people that you wish you had never hired or the company had never hired? And that was the, the, the question that had been posed to us uh, in my work. And we spent about 10 years uh, to researching this. And uh, one of the things that uh, the kind of answers we got from this were things like passion, attitude, work ethic, creative, good communicator, results oriented. Uh, and we asked top executives, we asked star performers themselves, we asked other researchers. Um, and we got about 45 different beliefs. Yeah, and I've listed some of the ones that were most frequent. Um, but uh, uh, they fell pretty neatly into three categories. And one was cognitive skills. These people were just super smart. You know, they had IQs that were off the charts, supposedly. Uh, they were great problem solvers. They were intuitive thinkers. So we heard a lot of cognitive stuff. We heard a lot of social things. You know, they uh, know how to uh, to interact with other people, they know how to schmooze, they know who to kiss up to, they know how to network. And then we heard personality things, right? That they just had this will to win, they were extremely persistent, they were go-getters, they were really time-oriented, lots of personality things. And we spent uh, uh, about uh, two years uh, testing out all of these different hypotheses that people had. Um, and we put 200 star performers in the room, 200 average performers in the room, and we tested their IQs, we tested their leadership skills, we tested their personalities. And uh, after that two years, we spent about a year analyzing all the data because uh, we had accumulated a lot of data when you have 45 different hypotheses, right? And you start looking at interaction effects, the number grows large very quickly. But uh, to cut it to the chase, we found no differences in these at all. And this was the big surprise to us and to everybody else. And uh, but instead, what we did is after this, we turned our attention to maybe it's not what they bring to work, which are their cognitive and social and personality uh, traits, 
maybe it's what they do with that when they're at work. And that was the kind of big breakthrough that we, uh, that we found is that star performers go about doing their work in fundamentally different ways than uh, the average and the less than average performers do. And the, what I'm showing you up here is the star performer model. There are nine strategies, work strategies, that the star performers use, which help them rise to the top. Now, I'm not, uh, like I say, this is just a quick history to let you get to where we are today. If you want more, you can take a look at the book. It's not very expensive on Amazon, uh, but this is what led us into uh, the current work. And the current work was, sure, there are people who are star performers, but who adds the most value to an organization? And so and when you think of value, there's lots of ways to think about it, but one way is economically, you know, who's making money for the company. And what we found is that there were three groups. Again, there were the people at the top who were adding a lot of value, people in the middle where most people were, and then there were people whose value was declining over time. And that led us to start thinking about, maybe it's not just how you do your work, but the kind of work that you actually do. And, uh, and so we asked the question, from which group does the company make its money? the top 10, the middle 80, the, the bottom 10. And for this, we had to take actually a step back. And we had to start thinking about what's a job? And most people think of their job as, well, you know, I trade uh, you know, my work, my labor for money, or maybe a job is how I get to use my professional skills, or maybe a job is how I gain social status, or I create an identity for myself. So I'm an investment banker, or I'm a consultant. And so that tells you something about me. Uh, but, but one of the things we found that the stars do uh, is that they think about it from the employer's point of view, which is a job is an opportunity to create more present or future value than it costs to keep you in that job. And that the star performers actually have a bigger delta in terms of their net worth to the company, right? Their costs are, turn out to be lower, their value is higher than the low and the average performers. And so, what we started to realize is that the work on this, uh, what separates the star from the average performers, that answered half of the equation is how you do your job. But the other half had to do with what do you actually do in your job? And that's uh, what we call the critical path. That the stars seem to understand what is this critical path between a company and its customer, right? And generally it's a product, it could be a service or some kind of hybrid, but there's, there's some way the, the supplier company gets it to the customer. And let me just give you a quick example. Think about a grocery store. If you want milk and bread and you go to the grocery store, a large supermarket, you, you, where do you have to walk, right? You have to walk all the way to the back of the grocery store. And the reason for that is two. One is that those are the two items that get replaced the most. And because deliveries happen in the rear of the store, it's easier for the, the, the the store itself to replenish the supply if they keep it at the back. So logistically that makes sense for the company. But they also put it in the back because they hope that while you're walking through, you remember that, oh, I need some bananas or I need diapers or I need a can of green beans, right? And so you'll pick up some things you didn't come in for and perhaps you'll then maybe even double the amount of revenue they get you know, on top of the bread and the bread and the milk. Now, you know, so from their point of view, this makes sense. But for the customer, the journey is, I don't want to do that. I just want bread and milk. I want to get in and out, right? It's, uh, I don't want to have to walk all the way to the back. And it's interesting because the suppliers, the grocery stores design their critical path to maximize their, their profits. Uh, but they made the journey for the customer more than most customers want to do. And this created, okay, a new critical path from competitors, which are the convenience stores, who understood that when people want bread and milk, they want to get it fast. And so the grocery business itself is about a $600 billion business. The convenience store, just if you count the, the food part, not the slurpees and not the gas, just the food part, is a $200 million business. So they created a competitor, okay, for a third of their total revenues. If you throw in now the drug stores and the corner bodega, et cetera, that's another 100 billion. So we're getting close to over half, right? That they gave away because they made the critical path too difficult for the customer. And so understanding this path is, is very interesting. And 
One of the things that I'm calling this past year of the pandemic, it's the year of the critical path. And the reason is because companies had to figure out very quickly, how do they retain their customers, right? As we shut down businesses, particularly we know in the hospitality side, the restaurant, the hotels, et cetera, they had to figure out if we close, how do we stay in business? How do we keep our customers? And many of them had to pivot, right? To going into takeout. Uh, we know restaurants were selling toilet paper and selling uh, food, groceries out of, their, uh, out of their restaurants as another way to keep their customers. And companies had to make the decision, what is our critical path now and who's on it and who's not gonna be on it? Because if you're not on it, we're gonna furlough you, right? And so that led to this notion of what is this critical path and where are you on it? And that there's two parts to it. There's the cost side and there's the revenue side. And then there's today's critical path and there's tomorrow's critical path. And there's always tension between today and tomorrow, right? Today's providing the money that will feed and make tomorrow available. But at the same time, today wants credit for that. Uh, but you have to figure out which side you're on. And that leads to you know, the value chain. Most of you from the business school will be familiar with some version of this. But the critical path is in the center, okay, bordered by the two uh, yellow lines and either you're developing the product, making it, selling it, delivering it, offering customer support, you're somehow touching the customer and touching the product, getting the product to the customer. Okay, this is where the company makes its money. And this is where during the past year, companies had to figure out, okay, who's on this path? And if you're not on the path, then perhaps uh, we don't need you right now, right? We're gonna furlough you. Now you can see the top uh, bar, those are all the managers who manage people on the critical path, right? And the bottom bar is all the organizational support functions. Now, one thing I wanna say is if think about your own job and think about, are you on the, the middle path? Or are you on the top or are you on the bottom bar? If you're either on the top or the bottom bar, every day you go to work, the first thing you should do is get down on your knees and give a bow to everybody that's in the middle. And the reason is because they're the ones who are making the money that allow you to have a salary. And you should be thinking, if you're in the top or the bottom bars, you should be thinking every day, how do I help them do a better job on that critical path? Because if they do a good job on that, I get to keep my job. As I said, during the furlough time, it was a lot of people who are particularly on the bottom bar uh, that uh, saw their jobs evaporate. So, if we think about this, right, if you're on the cost side, so if, you, if you're on the, say, manufacturing side or whatever, you're trying to drive costs down. If you're on the sales side, you're trying to raise the revenues. Oh, excuse me. And all this is so that we can please our, customers, our shareholders, right? And if you don't, if the company doesn't get its critical path right, then either current shareholders or potential shareholders, hedge funds, okay, private equity firms or some other, some other company that might do a takeover, they're gonna come in and swoop in and change your critical path for you. And there's a number of examples of that, the, the most um, glaring one here in Pittsburgh was when Heinz was taken over uh, by 3G out of Brazil. Um, and uh, you know, over a third of the Heinz employees lost their jobs because 3G decided that they weren't on the critical path, they weren't necessary for the critical path. So, it's, you know, the shareholders will make sure uh, that you're, you're focused on the critical path or they should, or as I say, there'll be replacement that will come in and do it. And now we can talk about the customers. I've been mainly talking about the, the company, but if we talk about the customers, that you have to keep in mind that if you're the supplier, your revenues are your customer's cost. And so you have to understand what is their critical path and what you add to their critical path that justifies their cost to create your revenues. So if you're in the um, grocery store business, you better understand uh, the, the critical path for your customers. Because if you don't, then they're gonna find an alternative supplier, as I mentioned before, they did with uh, the convenience store. And, and likewise, you have to think about your competitors, right? That the competitors, all they have their own critical path and they're gonna go after your best employees and say, look, we have a better critical path than your current employer and you should come to work for us, right? And so, and the competitors can come from different sources, right? Your direct competitors, 
industry competitors, but then other industries come and swoop in. Okay, I mean, that's been Amazon's uh, uh, kind of modus operandi, right? As they come in and swoop in into other industries uh, when uh, the competitors and industry competitors aren't expecting it. And likewise, uh, you know, when new competitors come in and particularly disruptive competitors. And one of the things I want you to take away from today is anytime you hear the term disruption, right? It's almost always disruption of the critical path. So Uber, okay, disrupted the taxi cab uh, critical path, right? Walmart uh, disrupted the department store critical path. So disruption is almost, talk, almost always talking about the critical path. And likewise, all these folks, your competitors are after your shareholders saying here, invest your money in us, we'll give you a better return. Now, where I want to end this is to talk about all the things in companies uh, that pull people away from the critical path, right? And you can think about all the work and, and I'd like you to think about for yourself, what are the things that you do every day that add no value to the company? And let me just say by my estimate, though I don't have the data yet to support this, but my estimate is that uh, anywhere between a third and 40% of an organization's uh, resources are devoted to things that add no value to critical path. So think, of, think about, in fact, what I'd like to do is think about what are the major forms of make work that pull you off the critical path? All the emails you, re, you get and you respond to that don't end up making a difference. Think of all the teams you've worked on for six months and you produce a product and it, nothing ever happens with that. It just goes on the shelf someplace, right? Um, you can think of all the reports that you file Okay, that seemed to not, nobody pays attention to. We, we worked with one company where they produced 50 reports every month. And we, when we actually did a survey, only 10 of those reports were read by anybody. So they were producing, they were using resources to produce 40 reports that nobody paid any attention to. So think about what is it? And one of the things we found with the star performers is that they really understand don't do make work, okay? Keep all your focus on the critical path. Um, and so to, to finish the, the story is that my work on star, what separates star from average performers, that answered half the equation, which is how you do your work. The work, this book on the critical path is, uh, it's not just how you do your work, but what you work on that makes a difference. And so uh, I think we can uh, stop here, John, and take any questions. And by the way, I feel like this was the speed dating version of, uh, of, of my work. So uh, uh, feel free to ask questions. I know I went through it pretty fast. Well, great. Thanks, Professor. We appreciate it. And uh, we do have some questions that have come in from the uh, alumni audience. Um, with this shrinking uh, critical path uh, or shortening the critical path, uh, is there value in that? Uh, I'm thinking about marketplaces, platforms, which in a way enables customers being producers and vice versa <laughs> like YouTube. So any thoughts on that? Absolutely. In fact, one of the things that uh, uh, when we train in the critical path, we say make it shorter, faster, smarter, better, more effective, more profitable. So making it shorter is one of the best ways. And just to go back to the grocery store example, that's what convenience stores did. They shortened the critical path. They did this, Uber did the same thing. They shortened the critical path. So that's one of the, that's one of the biggest opportunities is to make it shorter, make it faster, Okay, I have another question on what research have you seen on star performers, critical path and stakeholder capitalism, which is something that we're hearing a lot about these days. That is the need for companies to deliver value to more groups than just the customers and the shareholders. Yeah, in fact, I think they dovetail very nicely. Um, I've been involved with stakeholder capitalism for a long time and you know, bringing other stakeholders in, such as the community, right? Um, that uh, I think that you know, anytime you create a critical path, which is more effective uh, for the customers. It is often more effective for the community also. Uh, and we can use Uber. Uh, that one of the things that uh, I think that Uber did well and is that they removed the need for many millennials to have cars, right? So they reduced the amount of traffic in the community. Now we could say, are they doing the same thing with their gig workers? Uh, how's that working out? 
but I think that uh, generally when you uh, create a better critical path uh, for your customer, it's, it spills over into the community uh, and uh, has a positive effect. We have another unusual question here. Uh, one of our alums loves your books, but can uh, this be leveraged to family and raising kids? Any ideas on that? Absolutely. In fact, it's funny because the number of people that we train tell me how they uh, broach this with their families and uh, particularly trying to figure out what are all the things we're doing as a family and particularly with the kids that are on the critical path and how much are we doing, which is just make work. Uh, and I'll give a personal example for myself which is um, when we were raising our kids, I was in charge of laundry and I decided that we didn't need to sort the colors, right? That the kids were little, they didn't care if the, you know, the clothes were white or kind of grayish or kind of pinkish or whatever color they came out or they looked like tie dye. And so, uh, you know, it's, it just saved me time. And, uh, um, and my kids now kid me about it uh, now that they're adults and, uh, uh, starting off uh, looking at kids of their own. But uh, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, for, particularly for the, the parents to talk about what's really important for our family and our development, and let's cut out the rest of it. Well, another question is, what about uh, leadership uh, in this area? So you're a leader of an organization. How do you explain to your uh, workers throughout the organization at every level, how important the critical path is and their role in it. It sounds like getting everybody involved in the mission. Uh, uh, let me kind of reverse that question because my personal experience working with a number of companies on this, as I say, we train people and companies on the critical path, is that the, it often comes up from the bottom, is that the people who are doing the work are the ones who have to inform their managers. And, and what often happens when I'm training people let's say first level supervisors, and I'll tell them about the critical path, they'll say, and I'll say, you know, you really just gotta stay focused on this. And they'll say, yeah, but my boss isn't gonna go for this because my boss wants those reports. Uh, but, and I know these reports, nobody reads them, but my boss, you know, that's part of uh, his or her job is make sure these reports are done, so I've gotta do them. So I said, well, let me talk to your bosses. And then, then when I talk to that level, the next level up, they say, oh, I'm all in on this, but we gotta get it up to, you know, the, to the C-suite. And so it very often comes up from the bottom. Uh, and then the people in, at the C-suite, when I talk with them, they say, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, we we're finally getting it throughout the whole organization because their efforts to take it from the top down just weren't uh, having the effect they wanted to have. Can you share with uh, our alumni audience how you're delivering your new book and uh, how this has changed uh, since your other books? Sure. In fact, uh, let me go to the next slide here, which is if you want to read the book, there's two options. Uh, one is you can go to Amazon, not quite yet. It's hopefully going to be released uh, next Friday. Uh, but for that, you pay the amount. I think it's uh, 19 bucks or something. Uh, or you can read the free version uh, on my website. Um, and the reason I'm offering it as a free version, which I'm going to release it as a, uh, a serial. So it's going to go chapter by chapter. Uh, a couple times a week, a, a new chapter. The chapters are small. They're going to come out. And the reason I'm doing this is uh, I think, one, this is the way people read more now rather than get a book and read it all the way through. They read a little bit at a time. And so we're going to release it. But the other is that I'm hoping to build a community of folks uh, who can read the material and then interact with it, with me and with each other. And uh, we'll kind of crowdsource uh, this whole concept and integrate your ideas and, uh, and hopefully build a better second edition. Uh, and maybe you'll find things that you think I missed or you think I got it wrong, or you think that you've got a better example that we could plug in, whatever it might be. Uh, but the idea is to really create a learning community with each other. So I would encourage you, uh, if you want to do that, and this sounds interesting to you, you can go to my, uh, my website. Uh, next week, we will be uh, posting up a blog page uh, where you can sign up for it, and then you'll be on when we start releasing it, which will be the, the week later. Or if you want to do it today, you can just go to the contact page, drop me an email and uh, on that, and I'll make sure that you get notified when it starts. Um, but I think that uh, uh, I'm, what I'm hoping to do is have fun with this. And so feel free to invite your friends and, and coworkers and colleagues, and uh, for particularly for our students, let everybody know and in your classes, 
that uh, there's a free version and uh, I hope to see you all there. Well, thank you, Professor. What was the biggest challenge for you in doing your research for this particular uh, book? Uh, the biggest challenge was um, really at the first part was getting people to understand the notion of the critical path. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people do not understand how their companies make money. I worked with one company, this was a, uh, a, a Fortune 200 company, uh, and uh, they employed tens of thousands of people. And when I, I was with the top uh, 60 um, executives in the company, I asked them to just tell me, who are your top five customers? Right? And they said, well, yeah, we have different business units. I said, well, just you know, pick your business units and tell me you know, what you know. There are only four or five people out of this 60 who could name their top customers. And then they gave me all kinds of excuses. Well, I'm in human resources. Why do I need to know who the customer is, right? Or I'm in legal affairs or, you know, oh, I work here at headquarters. Somebody else, you know, sales and marketing, they take care of the customers. And what it hit me was that uh, if your top executives don't know who your top customers are, they don't understand how this company makes business, how do they translate that down to these tens of thousands of people who are working for them? And so that was kind of the biggest obstacle was trying to uh, convince people, the top managers, that you don't know how your company actually makes money. And it's important that you do, and it's important that you communicate it downward. And um, so that, uh, but one of the things that's been very gratifying because what we found in these, the companies that I work with is the critical path become uh, a framework and a, and a way to start changing the culture of the company. That's great. Uh, one last question here, I think, from our students. How would you uh, describe the critical path of Tesla? How would you interpret it? Well, you know, that's, that's interesting because Tesla um, and Elon Musk uh, operate in their own little world. Uh, and I think that Tesla, uh, I've not been the fan of Tesla that everybody else is. Um, uh, and I may be wrong here, but I'm guessing that Tesla is trying to make a play for somebody else to buy them because I think Elon Musk would like to get out of that and get more into the space business. Um, so I think that his critical path is uh, getting Tesla ready for somebody else to buy it. Um, and I think that may be different than the critical path that the customers want. Great. Well, thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate it. Looking forward to uh, a longer webinar in our Tepper webinar series later on to uh, once the book is fully out where we can explore this uh, important concept more at length. But thank you for joining us this afternoon. For our alumni audience, we uh, are have uh, two more Tepper uh, faculty members who are going to be speaking uh, very soon. So if you uh, if you you're welcome to to stay on or join us back at uh, for our next one, which will begin at uh, two fifteen. So thank you so much. Take care now. Hello, everybody. I look forward to seeing everybody back in person. Uh, I, I miss all of you. So take care, everybody.